Stitchin' and Pullin', a G's Bend Quilt, by Patricia C. McKissick, illustrated by Cosby A. Cabrera. G's Bend Women. G's Bend Women are mothers and grandmothers, wives, sisters and daughters, widows. G's Bend Women are cooks and homemakers, gardeners, church members, choir members, leaders. G's Bend Women are talented and creative, capable, makers of artful quilts, unmatched. G's Bend Women are relatives, neighbors, friends, same as me. Who would have thought? For as long as anybody can remember, the women of G's Bend have stitched up quilts to be slept on and under, sat on at a picnic, wrapped in when sick, or covered while with while reading on a cold winter night. Who would have thought that one day those same quilts would be hanging on museum walls, their makers famous? Who would have ever thought Beneath the quilting frame. Baby girl, that's me, played beneath the quilting frame on a nine patch quilt my great great grandmother and her sisters made when great gran was herself, baby girl. I remember the warm brown faces of my mama, grandma, and great gran as they sewed, talked, sang, and laughed above my tented playground. All the while, steady fingers pieced together colorful scraps of familiar cloth into something more lovely than anything they had been before. Oh, how I remember. I remember Mama's gentle voice singing softly, lulling her baby girl to sleep. Something else. My space beneath the quilting frame became too small for growing legs and a questioning mind. Busy threading needles and cutting scraps, I listened and learned the recipes for 11 kinds of jelly, what to do for teething toddlers, how to get rid of mold, and the words to a hundred hymns and gospel songs, all the while waiting for my turn. Where to start? Today, Grandma winked at me. There is a promise in her smile. It is your time, she says to piece your own quilt. How did you begin your first quilt? I asked Mama. She is getting ready for work and the long drive over to Camden. Look for the heart, she pulls me close. When you find the heart, your work will leap to life, strong, beautiful, and independent. Remembering, Mama told me, cloth has a memory. I hope the black corduroy remembers that it was once the pants my uncle wore to go vote for the first time, all clean and new. I hope the pink and green flowered tablecloth remembers the peach cobbler I spilled on it at the 4th of July picnic before my brother went off to school in Boston when we were still all together. I hope the white lace handkerchief reminds how pretty my cousin looked the day she got married to Junior all over again. I hope the dark blue work shirt remembers how hard Daddy has worked all his life. If by chance the cloth forgets, I want to always remember all of it. Nothing wasted. Grandma wants me to learn to quilt using the old ways, all by hand, nothing wasted. Her nut brown hands gently unravel the stitches from the hem of an old red and white gingham dress. Stitch by stitch, slowly she backs out of the dress, taking apart what she'd put together long ago. Snip, snip, pull. The thread is gone. The dress falls apart. A puddle of red and white gingham on the floor. Now I know. A patch of grandma's old dress will be the heart of my quilt puzzling the pieces. A quilt is a puzzle made of cloth, squares of red and white gingham, solid rectangles, print ones too, dotted triangles and a few plaids mixed in, flowered circles and long narrow strips spread out on the floor. Now comes the puzzling, mixing and matching colors, shapes and patterns, 
finding combinations of pieces that fit like a puzzle, making a picture, telling a story. The River Island. Grandma says her quilts tell a story, so mine will tell one too. My story. Long strips of brown cotton border three sides of my quilt, just as G's Bend is surrounded on three sides by brown muddy waters creating a river island perfect for snakes and alligators. A strip of green is the fourth border, a symbol of the fields where my ancestors worked cotton from Ken to Kant, Ken see in the morning until can't see at night. Years of toil on the G's Bend plantation, owned by the G family, who lived in a huge house called Sandy Hill. Above the green strip, I placed six squares that form the small communities of Brown Quarters, White Quarters, Rehoboth, Sodom, Over the Creek, Lebanon, where families with the same name are not kin by blood, but by plantation. Being discovered, a large smoke gray square stands for hard times because I've heard great grandpa say during the depression of the 1930s, Bad luck and trouble hovered over us sharecroppers like a big old smothering gray hand. Then great grand adds, our houses were one or two room shacks with dirt floors and plastered in newspaper to keep out the winter wind. Most of us didn't even have indoor plumbing, but it was home. The land was poor. My great grandparents were poorer still, but we didn't know it my mama puts in. We managed to be happy somehow. Then G's Bend was discovered by sociologists, historians, educators, and journalists who came from everywhere, some to help, some to share, some to study, some just to see. Photographers took hundreds of pictures. I've seen one of great grand with grandma, who was just a baby. G's Bend got the hiccups from all the excitement of cameras clicking, writers scribbling on pads, people talking breathlessly, never waiting for answers. Then it was over. G's Bend took a deep breath and went back to the way it had been before being discovered. Progress? Once the river ran free, then they built the dam and said it was progress. Acres and acres of rich farmland known as the bottom are flooded now. Land where black men and women named Petaway and Bennett grew cotton before the Civil War for no pay. Where sharecroppers named Mingo and Williams worked the soil for very little pay. And where black farmers named Bendolph, Young and Irby scratched out a living for slow pay. Now cotton mouse, alligators, and catfish live in the bottom. Call that progress? Colors. Grandma says blue cools. Red is loud and hard to control, like fire in a gossiping tongue. Green oozes. Orange laughs. Pink smiles. Yellow warms. Black protects. White shifts its shades from soft and bright to dingy. Purple is quiet, lavender is sweet smelling like a newborn baby, brown is hard working. Grandma says, colors show how you feel deep down inside. I feel yellow right now with a hint of orange. Stereotypes. Haven't been able to work on my quilt for two weeks. My cousin Ashlyn's been visiting from New York City. She left this morning. Yes, I will miss her, maybe. Ashlyn thinks she is as cool as blue. She reminds me of a duck, calm on the surface, but paddling like crazy underneath to stay afloat. The idea of making a quilt was way too country for Ashlyn. I'd rather paint or write a poem, she said. Quilting is painting a poem with fabric, I told her. Never mind. We still did what she wanted to do. TV, cell phones, CD players, video games, and a laptop computer with internet hookup. She was so surprised we have these things. I was surprised she thought we didn't. Pinky. Back in the 1960s, 
Mr. Willie Quill broke horses for the Alabama State Mounted Patrol. Fine horses, well-trained. Mr. Willie Quill knew his horses. He knew Jimmy Lee Jackson, too, a young man from Marion who was shot because he wanted to vote. We decided to protest the senseless killing by marching from Selma to the Capitol in Montgomery, remembers Mr. Willie Quill. The 54-mile march began in Selma at the Edmund Pettus Bridge. 600 of us stood on the bridge ready to march, but the governor said no, we couldn't. We walked anyway. Midway the bridge, the mounted troopers attacked. I remember seeing those horses heading straight into us. We held hands and prayed. Beating hooves pound against the blacktop and nightsticks hum as the troopers swing them like lassos. Mr. Willie Quill braces for death, but not today, not bloody Sunday. Mercifully, he sees one of his horses. I throw up my arm and hollered, Pinky! The horse broke stride and veered away, allowing Mr. Willie Quill to live, to tell the story. Mr. Willie Quill broke horses for the Alabama State Mounted Patrol. Fine horses, well-trained, ask anybody. Mr. Willie Quill knew his horses. Thank goodness Pinky knew him. Dr. King brings hope. I stitch a patch of bright pink to remember Pinky's story. Next to it, I sew a spotless white patch for the hope Dr. Martin Luther King brought to the bend. I've only read about Dr. King. Grandma saw him, heard him, marched with him. On a stormy February night in 1965, Dr. King spoke at Pleasant Grove Baptist Church. Grandma, with Mama in her arms, was among the first to arrive. Every pew was soon filled. People stood. Some even stood outside in the rain. With misty eyes, Grandma says, the words we heard that night changed our lives. Peace, hope, justice, equality, truth, love, freedom. I would have followed him anywhere. And she did. The right to vote. Folks from G's Bend crossed the river to Camden, Alabama to register to vote. The next week or so, they shut down the ferry. Though the ferry is open today, it wasn't then. The official reason was no money to keep it running. Grandma recalls that time. Sure as I tell you, was done to keep us from voting. Instead of a 20-minute ferry ride, the only way to get from G's Bend to Camden was to make the 50-mile trip by car or walk. I would have crawled to vote. Grandma's voice is strong. I believe her. What changed? In 1971, the all-black school was closed in G's Bend. Black students were bused to an all-white school 50 miles away. Then white students went to private schools. Today, the once all-white school is now mostly black. So what changed? Grandma votes, no matter what. I go to school, no matter where. Determination is rooted in our family tree, and that hasn't changed. By and by, how many times have I heard the woman sing and cry and comfort each other while quilting and remembering? So I sing too. I stitch a patch of golden thank yous for James Reeb, a young Boston preacher who was killed for believing in justice. In the background, I hear grandma's voice softly singing, when the morning comes, a bright blue piece of velvet for Viola Luizo, a Detroit housewife who also came to G's Bend to help with the big march. Brave Viola, wife, mother, friend, an American hero assassinated because she believed in justice and freedom. Will we really understand it better by and by? I will mourn in a big plaid people circle of white, black, brown, yellow, and red for Reverend Dr. King who was shot on that awful April day in Memphis in 1968, they say. Will we ever understand it by and by? Grandma always says that our darkness must have its hour. 
but morning always comes. Until then, we must tell the story of how we've overcome, so we'll understand it better, by and by. The Sewing Bee G's Bend quilters were discovered again in the 1960s, and the Freedom Quilting Bee was formed to make and sell quilts. Orders came all the way from New York City. Were you a part of the bee, great-grand? She closes her eyes and thinks before speaking. Each quilt meant a job, some money, a possible way out of poverty. My children profited from it. But with the orders also came strict rules. Not a stitch could be out of place. Only traditional designs could be used. Nine patch, wedding ring, bear claw. Any variations were rejected. Yes, more money, less freedom. I chose to stay free. My way with corduroy. Come the 1970s, the Freedom Quilting Bee began to fill orders for Sears Roebuck. Loads of corduroy were sent to G's Bend from Alabama Textile Mills. Big bolts of it for quilting pillows, bright pillows of red, yellow, blue, and green. Corduroy. There is music in Great Grand's voice when she recalls, Good times came stitching corduroy, great fabric for quilting my designs, my way. Love that corduroy. An understanding will come later. My quilt top is pieced. I spread it on the bed. Great Grand nods her approval. Mom si Mama smiles. Grandma leads me to the frame on the porch. Knowing hands put my quilt in place. How long will it take? I ask. Great Grand shushes me. Come, join us. She holds out her hand. Mama hums by and by. Five women surround me at the quilting frame, all stitching and pulling, singing the old spirituals, same as always, except today I am part of the group. Coffee-colored, berry-stained, nimble fingers with clumsy thumbs, stitching and pulling, together. In a slow and steady rhythm, patient hands that guide without force, teach without punishment, an old, old process. Woman stitching and pulling together. When will we finish? I ask. Grandma's eyes and the tilt of her head say, Be patient. Quilting takes time. Days. Even weeks. Relax and enjoy. I stitch and pull and listen in the warm yellow glow of an afternoon sun on the blue quiet of my grandma's porch. The other women smile because they know finished. For several days I've been asking, are we finished yet? Grandma laughs and her cheeks rise in gentle mounds. With this one last stitch, I bite the thread and knot it. Finished. I have made my first quilt, stitching and pulling with the others. But I am not complete. There are hundreds of ideas in my head, quilts that are about me, the place where I live, and the people who have been here for generations. Why are you crying, Grandma? I ask. An understanding will come, she says. By and by, I add.